Yo, what's going on guys? Arex here. Welcome back to the video for Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. The game launches this week. If you're a Borderlands fan, or you like D&D, or you like looty shooty stuff, then you might like this game. If you play Borderlands before, you will of course be familiar with the foundation of the game, but being a D&D-esque experience, bunkers and badasses, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands has a few twists. So for those of you jumping in for the first time, then here is your complete beginner's guide to the game, going over everything you need to know to get started. So if you guys do enjoy this, a like would be super appreciated. Let me know in the comments down below if you guys plan to jump in and if so which class are you going to be playing as first don't forget to subscribe if you guys enjoy the content and also i want to give a massive shout out to 2k for very kindly sponsoring this video so to begin with the very first thing you'll need to do is choose your fate maker one of the first most noteworthy departures from borderlands is of course the ability to create a custom character known as a fate maker there are six classes to choose from and an array of customization options but picking your class is the first and most important thing you must do since it's going to influence how you play the game now, if you guys have played RPGs or other things like that before, then there will of course be some familiar archetypes, but with a gearbox twist. So to give you a quick summary, we firstly have the Berserker, who are basically specialists of melee and frost damage. They can become enraged via their action skills, they can channel the power of frost through legendary weaponry that of course allows them to freeze and shatter their enemies, they wield a giant big ass axe which you can basically spin to win, activate this, spin and watch as things die, they are hella cool and they can even channel their bloodthirst to leech life from fallen foes using a dash of occult magic. Alternatively, another one for the melee focused ones out there and the class that I chose to start the game is the Clawbringer. Clawbringers focus on fire and lightning damage and they wield a giant big ass hammer. This is basically like Thor in Tiny Tina's Wonderland. Their dragon aura empowers the whole party with additional fire damage and more. They can also throw their spectral hammer at enemies in a very sort of Thor-esque fashion, dealing lightning damage, slamming it on the ground and of course also allowing you to create a massive fire nova and they even have a trusty wyvern companion that flies along at their side breathing fire upon their enemies and raking them with razor sharp claws. Meanwhile, you then have the Graveborn, who of course the masters of kill skills, spells, and dark magic. Think of it kind of like your necromancers in this game to a degree. They use their Demi Lich Companion, another of course companion based class, and of course their sacrificial action skills to enact suffering on their enemies. And spells cast by the Graveborn will also cause the Demi Lich to cast their own unique spells. So basically, it's like dishing out two spells at once. However, if you do like the spells, you also have the spell shots. These are of course about combining spells with guns. This is actually one of the classes that allows you to equip two spells, which of course is another unique aspect in this game. And their spell weaving abilities increases their spell damage and their fire rate, as of course they cast spells or reload. They also have the rather funny ability to be able to polymorph enemies, turning them into giant harmless skeep, which of course can take even the most ferocious enemies and put them on a cooldown. Your Spore Warden is of course your fun guy of the list, although if you do have a max party size there might not be much room for these guys, however these are the guys with the Mushroom Companions. Yes, thank you, I hope you guys appreciate the jokes. They're of course another pet class which actually feels a little bit more like Flak from Borderlands 3, since just like the Jabber, the Mushroom can also revive you when you go down, plus these guys have access to a fancy Spectral Bow. And you then have the Stabomancer, which basically is the rogue for the game. If you guys want to feel like Zero from Borderlands 2, focus on stealth, movement, sneaky crits, all that kind of stuff, and you also maybe want to snipe from the shadows, then the Stabomancer is the one for you. However, outside of that, moving on to the next thing, the multi-class system. If you guys have played Borderlands before, you may be a little bit confused when you initially start and see you only have access to one skill tree, but that is because this game features a multi-class system. Of course, you choose from one of the aforementioned six classes, but as you progress throughout the game, you unlock the ability to pick a second class from that same aforementioned list, and you can pick and choose whichever one that you like, apart from, of course, the same one again. And once unlocked, you can gain all the benefits from the second class to basically mix and match to create, in essence, your own custom class. You have class feats, which are your always on passive effects. These include unique increases to damage output, having trusty companions, things like that. So of course, if you do happen to multi-class with two pet based classes, then you can have two pets running around at the same time. You of course also have access to the action skills as well. Keep in mind you can only equip one action skill at a time, but if you started life as a Clawbringer, like I did for example, and then you chose a Berserker as your second one and decide you want to wield a frozen axe to spin to win, then you can do that as well. In addition to this, you of course also have some of your kill skills, the other things like that. So if you do want to create some of those mixed builds and basically take elements from one to the other, for example, you might want to take say the Stabomancer and combine it with elements of say Berserker to see if you can make an OP crit melee sneaky build, things like that, there's definitely some fun permutations. Also, fun additional note, when you do combine two classes, it actually changes the name of your class to like a combination between both. And additionally, while your choice at the beginning of the game is locked in, once you get to the end of the game and you get to max level, you will have the freedom to swap out your second class choice. So if you decide that you want to make a new build, then that option will be open to you. 
Now moving on from there, the overworld. When you're not shooting and looting fantasy creatures, you'll of course be navigating the overworld. This is an expansive map that connects many of the hotspots of the Wonderlands, so when you're not engaged in of course your first person combat or exploring new areas up close, you get the third person bird's eye view of your little bobblehead fate maker character which looks hella cool and you can then explore to your heart's content. If you venture off the beaten track you can of course unlock shortcuts, you can find some loot, you can find chests, other things like that, lucky dice, all of these things that can net your rewards, you can even find buff granting shrines and there are even optional areas that of course have their own quest lines so for those of you that want to maximize your experience don't just go from point A to point B, take your time, explore the overworld, maybe you'll find some secrets, you might get some cool loot in the process and it allows you to further immerse yourself in the DD experience. Additionally, it's worth noting that you want to level up with side missions. Side missions are, of course, important in this game. While the nature of side missions does mean that you can pick and choose and do them whenever you want, some of the main story missions do jump up quite high in level requirements towards the end of the game. So while side missions are, by nature, optional, we would definitely recommend picking up a few along the way to ensure a smooth leveling experience. Side missions come in different forms. Sometimes they'll range from simple things like go here, kill this creature, get your reward. Other times they'll be full branching quest lines with their own stories and familiar characters. So not only are are they useful but they're also fun things to do along the way. Now of course one of the main things in the game is the loot. You are playing this game for loot, lots of it, and loot in this game falls into a variety of different categories. You of course have guns which you'll be familiar with if you've played Borderlands. There are fantastic weapons in this game, many of them with incredible visual differences and some of them even have the nice sort of D&D twist this time around but you'll also see some familiar weapon types from maybe some uh, manufacturers that you might have seen in previous games. That being said on top of that you also have melee weapons. Melee plays a much bigger role this time around and while it might not necessarily be as prevalent as guns or spells you do definitely lean more into and get use out of melee weapons this time around and there are so many to choose from you'll have swords hammers scythes and more so pick these up and use them as you go in addition to this you have spells which in this game are basically your grenades but much much flashier much more magical if you will some of these can buff you some of them can buff your team some of them will dish out incredible damage of course they come in a variety of different rarities they have different cast times sometimes they'll have multiple uses sometimes you can get different permutations of the same spell that can really bolster your build so take the time to test out different spells and see what works for you you also have body armor, which is kind of separate to shields. These are effectively like sort of the class mods of Borderlands. Equipping these, they will typically have some skill nodes that will unlock things in your skill trees. And as you get rarer versions of these, especially legendary ones, they'll actually change the armor and appearance of your character. And then finally, you also have things like rings, necklaces, wards. Rings will typically provide you with flat boost to your loadouts. Amulets are more likely to grant special effects. Of course, your wards are necessary shields to protect you from damage. Speaking of damage, to round things out, we of course also have different damage types. There are five elemental damage types available to you in this game. Frost, Lightning, Poison, Dark Magic and Fire. And when squaring off against enemies, taking a look at their health bar will actually indicate which elemental type will work best for them. Fire burns flesh, good against red health bars. Lightning zaps away wards, good against blue health bars. Poison seeps through armor, which is yellow health bars. Frost will chill enemies to the bone, white health bars. And if you don't mind dabbling in the occult, then dark magic will siphon your enemies of vitality. So keep this in mind as you're specking out your character. But for the time being, that's a little rundown on a few things you need to know to get you started in Tiny Tina's Wonderland. If you guys have any questions, by all means let us know in the comments down below. If you missed our recent video, be sure to check out this one and stay tuned for plenty more.